Haunted by a tragic past, a couple's quest to gift their young ward a car takes a nightmarish turn when a seemingly innocent car purchase leads them to a desolate, abandoned house. In a chilling encounter, they discover that some horrors are all too real, and their fight for survival becomes a night they'll never forget. I had been dating my boyfriend for over four years, and we had talked about getting married eventually. However, we decided to wait until we both finished school before taking that step. Our journey together had been filled with both joy and challenges, but the most haunting chapter in our relationship unfolded in our first year together. Tragedy struck early on when my boyfriend and his little sister lost their parents. I won't delve into the painful details out of respect for their privacy, but since that fateful day, my boyfriend took on the role of guardian for his younger sibling. At the time, he was 28, and she was just 16, thrust into a world of darkness. He became her father figure and mentor. Coping with such a profound loss at her age was incredibly tough for his sister, and I could never blame her for the struggles she faced. As the years passed and our relationship grew stronger, I found myself trying to offer guidance and support to his sister whenever I could. Together, we strived to create a loving and stable household for her. Being students, we often had to stretch our budget to make ends meet. When she turned 16, all she wanted was to obtain her driver's permit so she could eventually get her license. We did everything in our power to make that happen. However, when it came to buying her a car, our financial constraints were evident. Determined to make her dream a reality, my boyfriend and I started saving money from every paycheck. Over time, we managed to set aside a couple of thousand dollars, and we had grand plans to surprise her with a car for her birthday. We knew it wouldn't be a luxurious vehicle, but we hoped it would be better than what I received when I turned 16. As we explored options, my boyfriend suggested checking Facebook Marketplace, which seemed like a practical idea. We found a mix of vehicles, some in excellent condition and others not so much. Unfortunately, our initial inquiries about the decent cars either resulted in them being sold or not receiving any response. After a week of fruitless efforts, a man named Howard messaged me about a 2013 Chevy Cruze for $2,100. The pictures of the car looked pristine, and Howard assured us that the car was in great working condition. He explained that it belonged to his stepmother, who had recently moved out of state. She had instructed him to sell her belongings and split the profits evenly. I wasn't particularly interested in the backstory, all I cared about was getting a reliable car for my future sister-in-law. We agreed to meet and potentially purchase the car that day, setting a meeting time after 8 p.m., as we both had classes during the day. We decided not to inform his sister, who was at a friend's house that evening. That night, we embarked on a journey to see the car even though the location was quite a distance away. We were willing to make the effort if the car lived up to its description. The address Howard provided led us to an eerily dark and seemingly abandoned house in the middle of nowhere. Boards covered the windows, giving the impression that no one had lived there in years. I expressed my doubts to my boyfriend, but he, ever the optimist, believed we were in the right place and suggested the possibility that Howard might be struggling financially. Reluctantly, I messaged Howard, informing him of our arrival and expressing concern about the desolation around us. Within minutes, Howard replied, assuring us that he was inside, finalizing the paperwork, and would take us to see the car in the backyard. My unease grew and I pleaded with my boyfriend not to go inside. But, ignoring my fears, he insisted I stay in the car if I felt unsafe, which I did. As my boyfriend approached the house and entered, I noticed a faint light emanating from within, 
offering a glimmer of reassurance. However, my relief was short-lived. As I was getting into the driver's seat, I suddenly heard raised voices and a loud thud, accompanied by the sound of something breaking. I froze, my eyes fixed on the dark house, and within seconds, my boyfriend came rushing out, screaming for me to drive. The memory of his desperate scream still haunts me, making me sick to my core. He practically leaped into the passenger seat as four men emerged from the house. My boyfriend's cries were focused solely on getting away from that place. I sped away through the rural landscape until we reached a more populated area. Finally able to catch his breath, he recounted what had happened inside. He explained that as soon as he entered, someone struck him over the head with an object. Instinctively, he turned and pushed the assailant to the ground, causing the loud thud I had heard. It was only when all four men emerged from the house that he realized he was outnumbered. Naturally, we reported the incident, but we lacked substantial evidence. We had a few screenshots related to the car, but the license plate wasn't visible, and it was highly likely that the images were fake. Despite our efforts, nothing came of the report, leaving us with a deep sense of frustration and vulnerability. The thought that this could happen to others continues to haunt me. I hope that these unscrupulous individuals were eventually apprehended and that no one else has to endure the same terrifying ordeal that we did, or worse. While my optimism may have waned, my determination to protect my loved ones has only grown stronger. In the remote wilderness by a serene lake, a summer cookout takes a nightmarish turn when a simple boat ride becomes a desperate struggle for survival. Lost in the darkness, a group of friends encounter a mysterious fisherman with sinister intentions. As their once tranquil gathering descends into chaos, they must confront their deepest fears to escape the chilling horrors that lurk beneath the surface. It was a year ago, but the memory still haunts me. The worst experience of my life began innocently enough when my friend Shane decided to host a cookout. Our college friends had returned home for the summer, and Shane saw it as the perfect opportunity for a reunion. The summer day started as any other barbecue, with burgers sizzling on the grill, beers in hand, and the warmth of the sun on our backs. Shane's place was unlike anything we'd seen before, nestled in the remote wilderness by the serene shores of a lake. This rustic setting was a stark departure from Shane's city-centric life, where he had always lived, studied, and worked. It was surprising to see him embrace the great outdoors with such enthusiasm. Shane's newfound love for nature stemmed from his recent job, which allowed him to work remotely. He'd used a substantial bonus to buy a boat, despite having no prior experience. As the afternoon wore on, our friends began pestering him to take the boat out on the lake. Although hesitant at first, Shane eventually yielded to the collective pressure. From the outset, my unease about the boat ride grew. Shane struggled to untie the boat from the dock, and it took a good 15 minutes of fumbling to get it afloat. It was clear he had little experience, especially on his own. By 5 p.m., we had ventured far from Shane's house, and my anxiety grew. I suggested we stay close to shore and return before nightfall. However, the others were eager to explore, pushing Shane to go further out. As twilight descended, Shane's nervousness became palpable. He admitted he wasn't sure of our location, and panic began to set in. Frustration mounted, and tempers flared as Shane blamed us for pressuring him into taking the boat. Around 8.30 p.m., darkness fell, accompanied by a light rain that chilled the air. Huddled under the boat's canopy, I suggested calling for help, 
but Shane vehemently opposed it. He revealed that he lacked the necessary licenses and insurance, risking hefty fines if the police were involved. So, we continued to drift aimlessly on the darkened lake. As the night dragged on, our initial fear gave way to annoyance. Being cold, wet, and angry outweighed any lingering fears. Close to 10 p.m., Shane suddenly claimed to recognize our location and that we were almost back at his place. However, relief was short-lived when we realized we were nowhere near familiar landmarks. Finally, I had the idea to check the GPS, a simple solution that had eluded us until now, likely due to a mix of alcohol and inexperience. Once we regained a signal, we made a shocking discovery. We were not only far from Shane's house but stranded in the middle of nowhere, with a small, eerie island as the only visible shore. After some initial panic and frantic exchanges, we agreed to work together to find our way back. The plan was to follow the shoreline using the GPS once we reached land. It took some time, but we eventually made it to shore. About 10 minutes into our journey along the shore, we spotted another boat approaching in the distance. Eager for guidance, Shane signaled the approaching vessel. However, the stranger on board exuded an unsettling aura. He claimed to know the way back and offered to lead us, despite our GPS suggesting otherwise. With skepticism growing, I questioned the stranger's directions, but Shane brushed it off, suggesting that the fisherman knew shortcuts. Around 11.30 p.m., the fisherman docked at a remote location and inquired about our fuel situation. Shane admitted we were nearly out. The fisherman offered to fill our tank but claimed to have injured his back and needed assistance. Reluctantly, three of us disembarked to help the fisherman fetch fuel. As we followed him towards a nearby shack, it became clear that something was amiss. There was no house in sight, just a desolate area with trees and the small shack. The fisherman instructed us to open the door, but upon doing so, we discovered it was empty. Suddenly, screams erupted from our friends back on the boat. Panic surged through us. The fisherman had seized the opportunity to jump into Shane's boat and started the engine. Shane and I leaped into the water and swam towards the boat, causing the fisherman to abandon his plan and swim to shore, disappearing into the darkness. We reunited with our terrified friends on the rickety dock and called the police with the limited phone service we had left. At that point, I disregarded Shane's objections. The police eventually arrived, and we learned that the fisherman's boat had been stolen. Shane faced consequences for lacking the proper boat documentation, but he continued to blame me for calling the police, even though it was clear that my action had likely prevented a dangerous situation from escalating further. In the aftermath, my friendship with Shane deteriorated as he continued to hold me responsible for the ordeal. The mystery of the fisherman's intentions remained unsolved, leaving us with a chilling reminder of one of the most harrowing nights of our lives.